Now, we're in this series called Imago Dei. He said, what does that mean? Well, that's Latin for the image of God. And we base this entire series out of Genesis where God tells us in the creation account why he created humans, what the purpose for human beings would be that we were to worship God. Over the past several weeks, we've answered some questions that I think that are relevant to our culture today. By the way, the Word of God is always relevant. We believe it's God's inspired Word, and when it comes from God, then it's for us. And so, um, we've talked about that in the life of a believer, there is no room for racism or prejudice. We've talked about that in the life of a believer, we have great value. Now, I realize that we have a culture today that kind of screws up this idea of, of your self-worth. Because what happens is when you get your self-worth from something other than God, then it begins to screw up your life and it fills you with pride. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that it's not okay to build up your children or to compliment people. It is. But the idea that we get our self-worth from anything other than God and fulfilling his purposes in our life, it derails us. And then you get a false sense of value and a false sense of worship in your life. By the way, you have great value, value beyond what you can imagine. You say, why is that? Because value comes from what a person is willing to pay for that thing. How many have seen the movie Titanic? Seen that movie before? Uh, if you remember that movie, it came out a long time ago, and that song by Celine Dion, first time I heard it, I thought, man, that was wonderful. By the 10 millionth time I heard it, I wanted to hurt somebody when it came on, all right? But you remember there, that was all the rage. I read a story about a woman, I believe it was, that went to a, uh, like a little pawn shop, and she loved to buy frames for pictures. And she bought them, and some were antiques, and some of them she would just get, and she'd paint them, and, and she liked doing that. She bought this one frame that had a picture in it, and she took it out, and in the inside of that frame, between the cardboard and the picture on the front, there was a menu from lunch on the day that the Titanic sank. Some person had been in first class, obviously, and they had that in their pocket. Well, they got that, and this person had put that in uh, that little frame. This person bought this frame for a dollar, and they sold that little menu from the Titanic, the day that it sank, for over $100,000. Now, what is the point? The point is something is valuable by what someone's willing to pay for it. Now, I probably, I shouldn't say probably, I definitely would not have paid $100,000 for a menu from the Titanic unless I could buy it and sell it and make money on it, all right? But the reason you have value is not because some person has built up your ego, but rather it's because what God was willing to pay for you. The Bible tells us that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, what did he do to pay for us? The Bible says he became sin. So uh, he that had no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's how much value you have. God loves people more than anything. So we've learned that how we should treat people. Well, today I want to talk about a subject that I believe comes right from Scripture, and it is very relevant to where we are today. And here's the topic, do sex and gender matter? Do sex and gender matter? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? Today, that's, uh, everyone discusses that with transgenderism and all of the stuff that goes along with that. Well, let's actually see what God says about it. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. That word him in the original language. In Hebrew, it's, it's the word for mankind. So he created mankind 
in his image, male and female, he created them. Not just man, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. You need to remember that. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We've talked about this mandate that God gives us in our work and spiritually speaking, uh, what those words mean when we rule and we have dominion and we are to subdue things and that God has created us to reign in him. And uh, what we, we looked at that. So today, we're going to, I'm just going to give you three thoughts to answer the question biblically, not culturally, because quite frankly, it doesn't matter what culture says. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter who uh, controls the political scene, okay? God didn't call us to be political. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't vote. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't vote your conscience. I hope you do. I hope you get involved. We don't talk about politics here because we talk about the Word of God here and what God has called us to do and to be, okay? You figure all that other stuff out, okay? But here's the point, and I don't want you to miss it. We want to see what God says about something. So to answer the question, do do sex and gender matter? Well, I believe it does. Number one, God created male and female. I want you to see that. We believe that sex and gender matter because God created male and female. You see, the image of God involves gender. Now, you may never have thought about that before, but it does. God said, uh, male and female, in my image. Now, how can a man and a woman both be made in the image of God if God is designated as male or whatever? Well, the truth is God decreed and declared that both male and female are very important and it is God's divine decree. We were created male and female. Why is that? Well, because the gender discussion is about more than sex. It's about more than that. It is about what it means to be human. And God created you like you are for a purpose. Let me tell you this, being a woman is wonderful if you're a woman. Being a man is wonderful if you're a man. Why? Because God decreed that. God declared that. Humans are the crown of God's creation. So understand this, when you read the creation story, God begins with the earth and the elements and separating the sky and the water and all this stuff. And then he creates animals and fish and birds and and all this stuff. And the apex of creation is human beings. Humans are the crown of God's creation and male and female are divine designations. Now, there's some obvious reasons for that, but there are some reasons that are not so obvious that you ought to know. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 11 and 12, the apostle Paul writes this. He says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but remember that in God's plan, men and women need each other. Now, that's obvious in procreation, right? I mean, you can't have a child without a man and a woman, right? It takes both. But when God said that men and women need each other, and that's a part of his plan, he was talking about more than just marriage relationships. He was talking about that in the church, men and women need each other. Let me say this, and I say this on the authority of God's Word and the authority of Scripture. God needs strong men in the church for the church to survive. But that's not all. Listen, God needs strong, committed women in the church for the church to survive. See, this is not the word of Richie. This is the word of God. He says that men and women need each other for although, and he gives this illustration, for although the first woman came out of man, you remember the story, God created woman from man's side, not from his head, not from his foot. God didn't design man to be uh, you know, the mean dictator or 
the one that is subdued. He rather brought the woman from the side near his heart. The woman came from man, and all men have been born from women ever since, and both men and women come from God, their creator. So God created male and female. And then, and I'm going to say this, and I want to say this with sensitivity and love and grace. Rejecting God's created order is foolish and sinful. So what in the world are you talking about? Are you being mean? I'm not being mean at all. I want to, once again, read to you from Scripture. Romans chapter 1. If you know much about the book of Romans, it was written by the Apostle Paul. Now, we believe that the Bible is Holy Scripture. It's inspired by God. It is both from God and human authors. The Holy Spirit, the, the word inspired, which the Bible uses, it means, to, uh, it means God breathed. God breathed this word for us. It is for us. It is authoritative in our life. And Paul, if you take the book of Romans, which is actually a letter, it is one, of, you know, aside from the fact that it's Holy Scripture, it is one of the most brilliant pieces of literature that has ever been penned. It stacks up against the world's greatest literature without question and leaves the others behind. Why? Paul used, and Paul would have been a PhD in our culture today. He was educated by Gamaliel. He was a brilliant man. And in the writing of the book of Romans, he, he wrote to largely a, a Jewish audience, okay? Uh, the Jewish people were the ones that received much of this scripture to begin with, and they received Jesus as the Messiah. They became followers of Christ, and the church spread around the world to the Gentiles and to every uh, one that heard it. But he writes this because the reason that the chapter one is written the way it was is he kind of it was a hook. He was sucking in the Jewish readers because the Jewish readers, what they thought was that they were more spiritual than everybody else. They thought because they were Jewish that they were automatically going to heaven. They thought, just like many religious people today that grew up in church because their grandma bought a pew at the Methodist church and there's a little plaque on it, and some of you look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. How many know what I'm talking about? You've been in one. All right, you know what I'm talking about. There are people like that today that believe that just because their grandma was a Christian that they're going to heaven. But Paul writes this, and he, he sucks them in. He says, I want you to get this sin from these sinful people, and they're so bad. And the Jewish people are like, yeah, you give it to those Gentiles. But then if you read the book of Romans in chapter 2, he says, but such are you. <laughs> he just kind of sucked them in and said, we're all sinners. We all need Jesus. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, as he began to pre uh, progress, that all have sinned and we all fall short of God's glory. Well, listen to what he writes. And he's writing about people that began to worship the creation rather than the creator. He says, yes, they knew about him, about God, all right, but they wouldn't admit it or worship him or even thank him for his daily care. And after a while, they began to think up silly ideas of what God was like and what he wanted them to do. Does that not describe our culture today? The result was that their foolish minds became dark and confused. You see, when we begin to live this way, and reject God's truth. Do I believe that there are mental conditions that we have to have care for and love people and help them and get them psychological and medical treatment? Absolutely. I don't think there's any doubt about that, okay? But make no mistake, rejecting God's created order is both foolish and sinful. Listen to what Paul writes just a couple verses down. Romans 1, 28, since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God. Do we not live in a culture like that today? They want to reject God. They want to reject absolute truth. They want to reject the word of God. When people begin to do that, notice what happens. He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. What does that mean? It means that God's not going to force you to live anyway. You're going to stand before God one day. And the truth is, you have a free will. 
And you can choose. You can either choose to love God, to serve him. Jesus said that the entire Bible is wrapped up in two statements. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. We talked about that the other week. Loving God with your heart is not enough. You can love God emotionally and love the music and come and say, oh, it's so wonderful. But that's only a part of it. You can love God with your mind. Think about Christian things. And, and people that do that, they, they uh, logically approach things. And what they say is, well, you know, you shouldn't live this type of way. And what happens is when you only love God with your mind, you become mean. It means spirited and judgmental. And then there are those that you love God with your heart and your mind and your soul. Your soul is your, is your mind, your decision-making, your will and volition, and your emotions. It's the complete human, okay? So we're to love God in those ways. But then he says you're to love your neighbor as yourself. And so here's what we learn from Scripture. It's not enough just to come to church and say, oh, I love church. I, I love Jesus because it feels good. It's not enough just to think morally because Jesus did not come to make you moral. Jesus came to bring dead things to life. And make no mistake about it, the greatest morality you can possibly have falls short of God's glory. And apart from Jesus Christ, your morality, are there moral people in the world? Sure. I mean, look, the truth is, uh, most of you are probably more moral than the average person when it comes to morality. I doubt, there may be some, I doubt there are very many mass murderers in the room today, okay? At least I hope there's not, all right? Um, if it turns out one day that we had a room full of mass murderers, then I'll stand corrected, okay? And when it comes to morality, most of you, most of you, you're, you're probably pretty good. You're decent. You're, you're good, good, good people, as they say. But that's not why Jesus came. If you think that Christianity is about morality, then you've not really studied Scripture. Am I suggesting you should be immoral? Of course not. Yes, you should be moral. But that's not the ultimate purpose. He came. He who knew no sin came and became our sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus came to bring dead things to life. He came to bring you into a relationship with the Father. Now, as a result of that, will you become more moral? Absolutely. But don't think that the path to Jesus is through your good deeds because they're just simply not good enough. Well, he goes on and he says that um, we are created male and female. We need each other. Well, what does that mean for today? You are who God says you are. Pretty simple, isn't it? Uh, gender dysphoria is rooted in self-worship. Not, once again, I'm not denying that there are mental conditions and psychological things that need help. I'm not remotely saying that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. People need help. They need love. They need ministry, okay? Uh, but this idea that just because you say, well, we're going to, take this and we're going to embrace it because that's just being nice. And, and I really do believe that most people in embracing this, that the, their, their real motive is probably good. They want to be kind. They want to be a blessing. But listen, uh, God says that when you stop seeing what he did, you begin to worship self. And then I would say this, that it's okay for men to be men. We need to teach our boys to be boys. We need to teach boys to embrace biblical manhood. We need to teach boys that they are important. We need to teach boys that being a man is more than just being a grown-up, more than just physical maturity, that uh, it requires responsibility and strength of character to be a man. That's what God has called men to do and to be. It's okay. We should embrace Men, listen, is there such thing as toxic masculinity? Well, I'm sure that there are toxic males. But this idea that being made in the image of God for who you are called to be and embracing that, it's not toxic, it's biblical. You say, well, um, does that mean that I can mistreat my wife? 
read the Bible, bozo. All right, that's not what it means at all. It don't mean that you come home and kick the door down and, and demand things. Okay, good luck with that, all right? I mean, look, the fact is you can't treat your wife uh, bad and ignore her all day and then expect her to be, you know what, in the bedroom, all right? You know what I'm saying? Look, the tra- <laughs> some of you women said, all right, and amen too much, all right? So, <laughs> amen, pastor, you, you tell it. Well, let me move on, all right? It's okay for women to be women, According to Scripture, we need to teach our girls to be girls. It's okay to be feminine. In fact, it's a wonderful thing for a woman to be feminine. You need to teach girls that they are important. We need to teach our girls to embrace biblical womanhood. We need to teach our girls that being a woman is more than just physical maturity. Let me me speak with a pastor's heart for just a second. In the culture that we live in today, there are many women and young girls that come from broken homes, that come from difficult circumstances, and they feed on social media, they feed on the internet, they feed on television programs, and in their mind, the way that they think that they are valuable is really the very opposite of what makes them valuable. They think that by being a sex object, that's what makes them attractive and valuable. Now, God created you as a sexual being. Don't don't misunderstand me. But I'm just simply saying that your value does not come because you have a lot of guys lusting after you. That's not where your value is, okay? Now, it is okay for a woman to be a woman. It's It's an okay thing for a woman to pursue biblical womanhood. Now, let me tell you what the Bible does not say about biblical womanhood, because this is where things get confusing from time to time, because there have been a bunch of men in the past that have not fully taught Scripture the way that it is. Now, if you read in the New Testament, they did, when there are statements like, there's neither male nor female, bond or free in Christ, and when you begin to see that women could participate in the church, you need to understand the culture in which that was written. In the culture during that time, women weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to work outside the home. They weren't allowed to testify in court. They weren't allowed to own property. They were pretty much second-class citizens, and yet God elevated women to the position they should be in in the church, okay? Now, now don't, don't misunderstand what Scripture says. If you are one of those that believes that Scripture teaches that Uh, women are to be suppressed and women are to be uh, mistreated and women are to be object. You obviously have not read Scripture and you know nothing about history because where Christianity has taken root and the Word of God is taught uh, throughout world history, those are the places that women have the most rights, the most respect, and the most value. So it's okay for you to pursue biblical womanhood. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Bible does not, does not, listen closely, does not prohibit a woman from working outside the home, from being a leader, from owning a business, from doing the kind of work that fulfills her, makes her happy. Um, It does not have any, in fact, in Proverbs 31, once again, if you believe Scripture, and I do, In Proverbs chapter 31, it describes the woman whose value is far above rubies. Go read that and come away with some other idea other than that this woman was awesome. She was not just awesome in the home. She was a small business owner. She provided clothing for her children, for her family. She was a leader. She was incredible. So this idea that uh, women are to be second class is absolutely not scriptural. Okay? Now, once again, and I must say this, because Scripture does teach that we are to submit to one another. We are to submit. Wives, listen closely. Scripture says, submit to your husband. But leaving out the other part of that would be unfair and unbiblical. The Bible also says, husbands, we're to submit to our wives and their, her needs and all this kind of stuff. And here's the point. God requires you to submit. Listen, I'm going to use the word that so many people hate. Submit to each other in a biblical marriage. 
In other words, marriage is not the place where you come to get fulfilled. Now, hopefully your marriage will be fulfilling, and a biblical marriage is fulfilling, and it does meet needs in our life. But this idea that, well, she's my soulmate, and therefore, as long as we're soulmates, we're going to stay together. But then I love her, but I'm just not in love with her anymore. Um, can I give you a word from Greek to describe that? There's a Greek word called skubala, skubala. The Apostle Paul wrote it, and you know what it means? It means, and I'm going to say it the nice way, it means animal dung. Now, you can go ahead and make the connection in your mind about a word that we use today that would be the same as skubala in the, in the biblical language, and you would be accurate, Okay. That's what the, Paul, the Apostle Paul said. No, this stuff is, shall I say it, BS. So he said, biblical word. No, I'm not telling you to go tell your boss that, okay? Or, or uh, I'm not suggesting that you go around talking that way. What I'm saying is this. When we begin to reject the Word of God and believe things that are not true according to Scripture, and we begin to try to embrace things that are not what God's plan for us is, then we begin to live in a way that does not please God, and we begin to invite trouble into our lives. So once again, uh, my warning is, after you read Scripture, reject the nonsense of the world. Reject that unbiblical thinking. Embrace everything that being a godly woman entails. It's okay to be drawn to certain types of work. It doesn't make, does make you less than, ladies. Uh, the Bible does, not teach, uh, does teach that we're all equal in the eyes of God. We're equally loved. We're equally important. It teaches us that we're to be treated fairly and we're to have equal opportunities. But let me tell you what the Bible does not teach it does not teach equal outcomes. Now, I'm not trying to get over in the political realm, but I'm just simply saying this. God created you for his glory. He created you for his purpose. He has a plan and a job for you. And you don't need to feel the outside pressure of being conformed to what culture says that you should think like or that you should desire for a job. What you need to be is conformed to God's image and God's plan for your life. Now, with that said, every person is important. According to Scripture, every one of us is important in the church. But the Apostle Paul took it further in 1 Corinthians. He says that we're not all eyeballs in the body. What kind of body would that be? He said, if we're all eyes, where's the hearing? We're, we're not all eyes or ears or hands or feet, but we're all important. We're all needed. This idea that it doesn't matter if you're involved or not is a lie from the devil. This idea that it's not important for you to come or to be faithful or whatever or to use your gift you know what? Most of us do use our gift, but if we're not using it for the glory of God and we're not using it in the church, then we're failing to do what God has called us to do. And look, there, I do realize there's a difference between natural talent and spiritual gifts. God gives every believer at least one spiritual gift when you get saved. What is a spiritual gift? It's something that God, the Holy Spirit, supernaturally works through you in your life. Why? for the building of the body. Your spiritual gift is not for your own selfish reasons. Your spiritual gift is to build the church, to help other people. That's why it's there. Now, do our spiritual gifts and natural talents align from time to time? Of course. And, and God wants to use you. And so the point is that God created male and female. Now, I've got about five minutes left, okay? And I've got two more points. Now, if you try to measure the amount of time I spent on that first point with the amount of time that I'm going to spend on the last two points, we ain't going to get lunch on time, all right? That's what I'm saying. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to get this done in five minutes. Point number two, 
God blessed male and female. He made them, he created them, and then he blessed them. Interesting, isn't it, that he blessed them before they ever received a command from God to work or to do anything? Now, what does that mean? Well, I believe that it's a picture of the grace of God and how we're to live our lives. In other words, we are to work from God's blessing rather than for God's blessing. You see, if you get those two reversed, you're going to be a miserable Christian because all of your life you're going to be weighed down with a burden of guilt. I can never do enough. I'll never be nice enough. I'm never good enough. And, And you're going to be working for God's approval and working for God's blessing. But you know what God said to Adam and Eve before he ever made them one single command? He blessed them. They work from his blessing, not for his blessing. Now, when you get that God's grace is sufficient and you get that God's grace is important in life, you know what happens? You begin to work from his grace, not for his approval because you've already got that. But you begin, it takes away that cloud of guilt, that dark cloud that hangs over so many Christians' lives where they think that they're never enough and they believe the lies of the devil. You do remember that Jesus said that the enemy came to kill and to destroy and to steal. He wants to steal it from you. He wants to destroy you. He is a liar. He always says you're not enough, that you're not. And you're, look, let's be honest, you're not. Neither am I. But Jesus is. And because when we understand God's grace, you say, well, I don't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. You see, grace doesn't mean that you, in fact, it can't be earned if it's grace. And and that is a beautiful thing that God did. He blessed us. And when you begin to understand this, that it's a blessing to be male, made in the image of God. It's a blessing to be female and made in the image of God. It's a blessing. God did it for his glory. What did he bless in that creation story? He blessed creation. He blessed humans, and he blessed the Sabbath. That tells me that worshiping God, taking that, and I've said this many times, you can get more done in six days than you can in seven. You say, well, we're not under law anymore. That's true, but the Sabbath came before the law, and it's a universal principle. You need to take some time off. You need to take time to worship God. You see this idea that many modern Christians have that the church isn't important, that they don't need to go to church? That's just simply not biblical. Now, I'm not trying to be mean, God knows. But let me just say that even before the New Testament ever came, God blessed the Sabbath. It's important. Now, I realize that things come up. Jesus said, if your ox falls in the ditch on the Sabbath, you'll pull it out. But I grew up in a church where the pastor said this, and it's an old country saying, but I think it's true. He said, it's true if your ox falls in the ditch on the Sabbath, you need to pull it out. He said, but if the same ox falls in the same ditch every single week, he said, you either need to get rid of the ox or fill in the ditch. Now, I don't know how theological that is, but I do believe it. All right. Now, Anyway, and then God created them male and female for his divine purpose. That's the last thing. What were their purposes? It was the purpose of worship. He created us to worship him, to fill the earth with worshipers. He created us for the purpose of family. God said to multiply and fill the earth. That was more than a physical command. Obviously, we're to fill the earth with children. That's part of the command. Uh, but sin marred our life and it marred work, okay? And so we're created in the image of God to bring worship to this world. Uh, the purpose was work. Um, before the fall, man's relationship God, with God was beautiful. The man's relationship was, with work was beautiful. But man was to create, to rule, and have power over all of creation. But in sin, however. The earth was cursed. cursed. Death entered the scene. 
Curses entered the scene. As a result, mankind since has struggled mightily with work. Problems with money and poverty mark us now. Problems with worshiping our work, the stress of work, the greed that in just so encapsulates so many families. Families struggle with balancing work life and family life because of the curse. How do we overcome these challenges? You say, we don't live in a perfect world. All this stuff you've talked about, Pastor, sounds great if we lived in a perfect world or if I were perfect, but I'm not. And this world is not perfect, so what do I do? I'm glad you asked that question. Because let me tell you what the Bible says. We find in the Genesis story, okay, that when God gave all these commands, when God did all this, when he blessed them, there was an odd thing that we look at and we say, that's weird. You know what he commanded them to do? He commanded them to eat a lot of food. Now, he wasn't saying overeat, okay. But he said, go enjoy freely everything. You say, well, that just seems like God was providing for them. Exactly. That is what he was saying. I am the provider. You know what I've learned? I can plant an apple tree. I can fertilize an apple tree. I can cultivate an apple tree, but I can't make apples. Only God can do that. And what that tells me is that in everything in creation, from the very beginning, he wanted us to see that he alone is the one that provides for us. It's not creation. Don't worship your creation. It's not your job. You should have a job, okay? Don't, don't mooch off everybody else. But uh, that, that's not where your ultimate provision comes from. You know where it comes? It comes from Jesus in fact, after they sinned, God gave us the answer to the solution to the problem. Here's what he said. When Adam sinned, he asked a very important question. He said, Adam, where are you? God knew where he was. He wanted Adam to know where he was. And then what did he do? He said, he made coats of skin. There was a, an animal sacrifice that was made, a blood sacrifice. And here's what he said. He, when he began to talk to Satan, there in the Garden of Eden. He said, he said, you're going to be cursed, crawling on your belly the rest of your life. And then he said this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and you're going to bruise his heel. <laughs> He's going to crush your head. You say, what does that mean? That was a I believe the first prophecy that Jesus Christ would become sin for us and die on the cross, not to make us moral, but to bring us into right standing with the Heavenly Father, to make us alive in Him. And yes, Satan struck Jesus' heel because he died on that cross. Jesus became human. The second person of the Trinity became human, and he will forever be human, but he is God. He is divine, and he became human so he could re uh, represent us. He became human so he could die on the cross for our sins. And when he died on the cross, Satan struck his heel. And I'm sure he thought he had won. <laughs> And after one day, he's like, it's all good, boys. And after two days, he's like, y'all didn't listen to me. I was telling you, it's all good. But on that third day, on that third day, the Son of God stepped out of death and stepped out of that tomb. And with his heel, he crushed Satan's head. And he defeated him once and for all. You say, well, how, how do I live? You live through that power. It's not you. It's not you. But it's him. And he promised that if you trust him, he promised that if you believe in him, that he would save and he would change and he would bless. So receive it today. How many want to receive God's blessings today? That's what God has promised to us Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you in the name of Jesus. Jesus, I, I'm so overwhelmed every day that I think about it. The fact that you 
are God. But you became human. You were, became the God man so that you could reach me, so that you could reach people in this world, so that people could be saved, so that we could live not separated from you forever, but live in harmony and peace and relationship with you forever. And you said in Ephesians that for all of eternity, you're just going to pour out your grace. You're just going to show us the greatness of it. And every day in eternity, and I realize there aren't really days in eternity, but every moment we're going to say, well, man, that is better than what I just heard. That's better than before. And throughout all of eternity, we're going to be amazed by your grace. And for this, we thank you. For this, we embrace our belief in you. Lord, I realize that there are Christians, there are especially unbelievers that don't understand what it means to be a Christian. In their mind, they think that it's about rules. In their mind, they think it's about condemnation. But thank you, God, that you said there is therefore now no more condemnation for those that believe in you. And so, Lord, we embrace this beautiful, wonderful, amazing grace that you have given to us. Help us to love it. Help us to live it. In Jesus' name. I'm going to do something that I don't normally do. We've talked about God's grace today. Let's end today by singing about it a little bit. I'm going to try to do this. I know we got music playing, and I don't know if it's the right key or not. But amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found Was blind But now I see Heavenly Father, help us to see through the eyes of faith The grace that you have provided for us Help us not to embrace the curses of this world The philosophies of this world But help us to embrace your marvelous, wonderful, amazing grace. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen.